In between the real and the imaginary are fractals, computer-generated pictures of simple formulas, but the pictures are infinitely detailed. That a formula should have any pattern is a new idea, but do these patterns mean anything? This is the question Mandelbrot and others after him have explored. Fractals were named some 15 years ago by the mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot. He called them the geometry of nature because they are complex, organic looking shape. But they also capture the dynamics of nature. In a way, the geometry of circles and squares never could. Since fractals were discovered, artists have explored their visual beauty, while others have turned them into music so they could actually hear the sound of an equation, as well as see it. But beyond the poetry, are fractals the true geometry of nature? What I want to know as a mathematician is if they tell me anything about the dynamic world we live in. This is a film about fractals and the man who's synonymous with them, Benoit Mandelbrot. I started um, by not knowing at all what I would become, but I was always a mathematician at heart. The question is, what kind of mathematician? And uh, I had the kind of uh, hope to be doing something in which I would not be the millionth person after 15 giants to compete with, but um, to be, how to say, play in a field in which uh, would be more, uh, more virgin in a certain sense. I certainly was a rebel in my youth, uh, because I rebelled against what was the power and the trend of the day. The trend of the day was towards abstraction, towards algebra, and I was uh, interested in the real world, and I was uh, very much uh, working with shapes and not with formulas. The beauty of the endless details of fractals is that they are not made from exotic formulas. They spring from the same simple formulas that you learned in school to draw a simple static geometric object like a parabola. The crucial idea that Mandelbrot used in order to unlock the dynamic side of geometry, which is fractal geometry, is iteration. And iteration is just feedback. Take a formula. You feed a number in, you get a number out. In the old days, you would use this number to put a dot on a piece of paper and draw a curve. Now you don't do it anymore. You take the number you've just obtained and feed it back into the formula. So you get another number, and you feed it back again, and so on and so forth. Now let's look at the formula for a parabola. You take a number, you square it, and you add a constant to it. Let's choose a number and run the program. The numbers on the left, generated by the formula, are plotted on the real line and then fed back into the equation to generate the next number, and so on. But the line isn't the place to draw pictures because it's one-dimensional. Pictures are two-dimensional, so to draw them we need two-dimensional numbers. This may seem strange to you, but using two-dimensional numbers, the complex numbers, it's the very first thing that would occur to a mathematician. You see, complex numbers give breathing space to ordinary numbers by unfolding them. And this is just what occurred to the French mathematician Gaston Julliat, who actually taught Mandelbrot. He did not have a computer then, but was able to imagine the extraordinary objects that a repeated world could create. The Julia set. The simplest of rules has produced a geometric monster, a fractal. This is the monster that Julia brought to life. The Julia set is to fractal geometry what the circle is to school geometry. But unlike the circle, the Julia set isn't a single shape. It is a set of related shapes, all born from the same formula. There are, in fact, an infinite number of different Julia sets, which depend only on the value of the constant you start with. So, as you change the constant, the Julia set changes. And if you put one set after another, you see how Julia had unleashed not one, but a whole bestiary of wriggling monsters. Well, Julia, um, even though I did not follow Julia as uh, intellectually, I had a teacher at the Corporate Technique where I went. Uh, and uh, Julia was um, a man who liked, uh, I think he was a bit bored with his work. He was stopping to say, to give us advice about, about life. And one of the uh, aphorisms which he often repeated was that when you are uh, stumped in a pro the problem which is in, uh, on, the, on the real line, then to simplify, you must complexify. That is, the idea was that things are more complicated on the real line than they are on complex plane. 
that was, of course, the, the, the mainstream of thinking of the theory of complex, uh, functional complex variable. And Julia was very much part of it. And uh, that is something which struck my mind very strongly. And uh, many years later, when I uh, became interested again in iteration, the um, prevailing mood of, of community was to study iteration on a real line. I remembered my old Julia, his papers, and the fact that uh, perhaps uh, to simplify, I might try to complexify. And uh, that's how one of the main uh, impulses which uh, started me on this, on this subject. The great discovery Mandelbrot made was to find a unifying pattern which brought order to the zoo of fractals discovered by Julia. People knew that by changing the parabola rule, the constant you add after squaring, the shape of the Julia set would change. They also knew that there was an infinity of Julia set. What they didn't know was if there was any pattern link in them, or if it was just random. What Mandelbrot did was divide the Julia set into two families, those made of a single piece and those disintegrated into infinitely many fragments. Then, using a computer, he marked in blue those values of the constant for which the Julia set is made of a single piece, and in color, those for which it is not. And in this case, he also color-coded the degree of fragmentation. What he found is one of the most extraordinary mathematical objects ever discovered, the Mandelbrot set. It is a complete library of Julia sets, where every dot, every single detail, represent a different Julia set. In one infinitely detailed picture, Mandelbrot has described how all the Julia sets related to each other. The Mandelbrot set is a map of the world of Julia sets, bringing a dimension of order to it. When I first saw what came to be called the Mandelbrot set, uh, I had uh, my usual feeling when something important happens. Uh, initially, a feeling of uh, exhaustion, and then a feeling that I must explore it that um, this is something I don't know yet. I must become familiar with it. I must play with it. And the play, of course, meant in this case, uh, make pictures of it. So um, we spend nights uh, sitting in front of a computer and just uh, this thing blowing upon us. And very often we wondered whether it was real or whether we had, uh, were dreaming and we're pinching each other. It was the feeling of, at the same time, of great fatigue and extraordinary joy. But this feeling that somehow this thing must be understood, that we have stumbled upon something which was not uh, not the uh, everyday event was very, very uh, strong in our minds. Just as Mandelbrot added a dimension of understanding to the work of his teacher, Julia, so colleagues of Mandelbrot have gone on to explore higher and even more remote dimensions of fractal geometry. I started out thinking about the two-dimensional things as these are just fascinating, beautiful objects but they seem to be kind of decorative. They're, they're, not, uh, they're not real. They're sort of like you could put them on, on, a, on a canvas maybe, but you couldn't really experience them. And I, I wanted to see what shapes would look like if you, if you could really experience them, if you could move around them, or if, you could, you could, uh, if, if they existed in the same world that we're in. So I wanted to look at some kind of higher dimensional uh, creature that would be like the the things that I'd seen. And I, I, had, I had done some looking at quaternions when I was uh, doing mathematics. And I thought, well, here's a, here's a space that doesn't get a lot of mathematical attention, but, it, but it's naturally four-dimensional. It's naturally the place where we live. So why don't we take these two-dimensional things and look at them in, the, in, a, in a quaternion algebra, see, see what they look like. Norton found that two-dimensional Julia sets were just a slice of higher dimensional creatures living in quaternion space. At first, Norton only caught a 3D glimpse of the four-dimensional Julia sets. He could move around it, but the object itself was frozen, a 3D snapshot. I would start in one place, I'd look at it, and I'd, I'd see a shape. And then you go someplace else, and you see another shape. So it was like, uh, so like it wasn't like walking around the space. It was like uh, getting a snapshot. Four dimensions is a very big place, <laughs> and I really could never understand it. You know, I could never understand the whole space just by these isolated snapshots. 
you can't really see in in two or three dimensions evolving processes. And that's uh, I was starting to see from the, the numerous samples I'd taken of, of different isolated pictures that there were patterns that they would fit together, but I couldn't fit them together without without making an animation of them, making a sequence of, of frames and have it change over time. So I really had to use that uh, that fourth dimension, and that fourth dimension had to be time. People are designed to live in a, in a four-dimensional world where one of those dimensions is time. Our brains are equipped to, to understand things not in snapshots, but in how they evolve over time. And uh, if you don't exploit that, then you're limiting, you're limiting your experience. If you only look at static pictures, then, then you are uh, not opening all possibilities. Although explored in this most abstract setting, this idea of shapes as being dynamic, being a process of a time, is precisely the idea we need to apply fractal geometry to the growing shapes of the natural world. Nature is full of highly complicated objects, and their shape is the result of a growing process, which is dynamical. One way to model it could be to put in a computer all coordinates of all branches, but that would be insane. You have to construct it in the same way it constructed itself. If you could find a simple set of rules that could make a repeating pattern, you could describe the whole tree with just those few rules. What scientists at the forefront of research are trying to do today is not only to make more accurate pictures, but to go beyond that. They are trying to find iterated rules which grow the object in the same way that the real object grows, as the plants themselves do. L systems repeat simple shapes to build up complex branching and flowering patterns. Stems, leaves and flowers each have their own set of rules and starting shape. And there are even rules that control when and where leaves and flowers should be grown. Once 3D rules are added, the whole system grows realistic looking structures from nothing more than simple starting shapes and iterated rules. Living organisms are dynamic forms. The form is generated by a process. In fact, the process is the form and the form is the process. The two live together. If we believe that plants grow according to rules of the type we see in fractal geometry, then in fact we can begin to explore these rules and find out which ones can operate and which can't. And then we can take the next step, which is to say that evolution is an equivalent exploration of rules of this kind. And then we can understand which forms are possible and which forms are impossible that could not be generated by biological systems. Whether you believe that DNA is actually a fractal code or you take the more radical view that the laws of nature are fractal right down at the level of the physics and chemistry of life, iteration seems to be a powerful tool for understanding complex shapes. And it has opened the way for exploring the dynamics of how one shape can evolve into another. What lies at the heart of fractals is iteration. It's a fantastic, powerful way to look at mathematical and physical phenomena alike. It combines simplicity of rules with complexity of the final product. On this ground, I believe that we can begin to say that fractal geometry is the geometry of nature.